Okay. Okay. So we can start. Yes. 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 Okay. Great. Uh, so thanks. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming for the first meeting of our Warsaw Quantum Computing Group. Uh, so the first inaugural lecture will be given by Rafał Demkowicz Dobrzański, uh, Introduction to Quantum Computing. But yeah. Yes, but uh, before uh, wrap up that, I will uh, say a few words about the uh, story behind this group, so why, why uh, we meet today. Uh, a few months ago, uh, I was in London attending similar meetup, London Quantum Computing uh, Meetup. Uh, the title of the lecture was Quantum Computing Takes, takes Flight at the D-Wave. And I had interesting discussion with uh, people organizing this group, and we uh, came up with idea that it may be good to organize something similar in Warsaw and potentially collaborate, exchange lectures. So uh, yeah, they, they will be one of our uh, collaborators. Uh, but after coming back to Warsaw, I talked to some other people. So Rafa, for example, from Faculty of uh, Physics with Professor Mankiewicz as well, uh, from Polish Academy of Sciences, and Mateusz, also from University of Warsaw and a few other colleagues. And uh, yeah, we decided that it may be good to make it happen. And uh, that's why we uh, meet today. Uh, there are also some other um, uh, companies which already uh, supported us or at least uh, declared that they, they would like to support this initiative. Uh, so it's very likely that one of our next meetings will be hosted uh, by Google in Google Campus. Um, uh, we are also had discussions with Rigetti quantum computing uh, companies, so they are keen to um, also share some learning materials with us so we can, we can learn uh, how to use their quantum computing platform, how to develop uh, quantum uh, programs which can be run on their platform. Um, yeah, so the, the goals, uh, so there are three major goals of this group. The, the first goal is education. So as you know, uh, or at least maybe you heard that uh, the area of quantum computing uh, has recently uh, encountered very good progress. So uh, there are major, uh, in very important announcement that uh, given by some companies that uh, they were able to build larger quantum computers than we had even a few years ago. And some companies also released uh, programming frameworks, uh, which allow us to just uh, uh, develop quantum uh, programs and random quantum computing platforms. Uh, but also we learned that uh, there are many people interested in quantum computing here in Warsaw or in general in Poland. So we would like to integrate our community. And in the future, perhaps we can also start doing advanced research in topics related to quantum computing, probably especially in applications of quantum computing in artificial intelligence, machine learning. So the idea is to meet uh, once per month, at least at the beginning, uh, usually Mondays or Thursdays at 6 p.m. 
How do you think? Which day of week might be better? Monday, yesterday? Monday, okay, good. So let's let's try Monday. Uh, so uh, initially, uh, we plan to uh, organize the first meeting on 12th November, so exactly one week earlier. Uh, but as you know, uh, uh, this day was uh, announced to be uh, a holiday, national holiday. So we decided to uh, move this meeting to uh, to the next week. So that's why we we meet today. But but anyway, we also wanted to celebrate the 100th anniversary of regaining independence by by Poland. That was also one of reasons why we wanted to organize this first meeting on 12th November, and also that we organize it today. Uh, so today we meet at the Faculty of Mathematics, Informatics and Mechanics of the University of Warsaw. Uh, but we also had discussion with uh, people from Google and also from chess from Facebook. Uh, and it's very likely that uh, our next meetings will be uh, hosted uh, by Google and also by, by Facebook. Maybe some of them will be also on the Faculty of Physics, we'll see. Uh, so uh, Mm, our first meeting will be given by, by Rafa, so there will be only one speaker per meeting. Uh, but we also have plans to uh, later have uh, two speakers per, per meeting. So probably lecture talks will be a bit shorter, maybe not 60 minutes, but maybe 45 or 30 minutes, minutes plus discussion. Uh, and the default language is, is English. So I, I know from uh, the registration list that there are also people from uh, so who are not uh, are not uh, Polish speakers uh, who'd like to attend our our meetings as well. So we are planning to record uh, our meetings and then publish uh, the video on YouTube. So we already have our YouTube channel, and uh, yeah, we are also testing uh, live streaming on using Google uh, Hangouts on Air and and our YouTube channel. And we have Facebook group. There are more than 160 people right now there are even 170 in fact uh, there was also idea to create a mailing list so if you if you agree that that's that's a good idea then probably i will do it and uh, uh, send you invitation so probably that will be google google groups uh, mailing list um, okay, so today we have introduction to quantum computing. The next uh, meeting will be probably given by Piotr or maybe another person from his team. Uh, it will be introduction to programming quantum computers. Uh, next month in Dece December, so the exact date will be confirmed, but uh, initially the tentative date is 17th of December. And later in January and February, there will be two uh, meetings dedicated to uh, forest programming language from Rigetti. Um, yeah, it will be given probably by Michal Stenkwe. And uh, you can see uh, some other uh, possible topics for the next uh, semester, next next year. Um, so, yeah, so, but if you also have your own ideas, uh, maybe you would like to become a speaker or uh, you have some wishes uh, that we, will, we, we, should, uh, we should invite someone to give interesting lecture, then of course, feel free to uh, tell us and uh, we can adapt adjust our our agenda uh, all right so thanks thanks for your attention and now uh, Rafa, the floor is yours okay thanks a lot so i'm Rafał demkowiu dobrzeński and i work okay. and i work across the street the faculty of business so um, i want to give today Introductory talk so that somebody who doesn't know anything about quantum computing can learn something, and also people who know something will not be bored too much. So let me let me start by uh, by saying what is easy and difficult computation because this is basically where quantum computing can show some adventure over, over classical computing and quantum steps how we should first uh, define. What is difficult, what is easy to compute. So addition is easy because the number of operations is proportional to number of digits. So if you want to add two numbers with five digits, you perform operations which are proportional to the number of digits. So, so this is mean and scaling of complexity of the task. 
So this is easy. If you multiply, then you know what is the complexity? The number of digits? Linear? I don't know. If you do it at school, it's 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 not linear because you have to first multiply each digit by all others and then add. So it's like any square operations, yes? Take one digit multiplied by everyone, and then definitely multiply by everyone and then So it's n squared. Maybe you can do it in more clever way from this part of the world. Better, but okay. at school we do it like this. And it's and, and the faculty of physics we also do it like this. <laughs> so but still it's easy uh, task because it scales quadratically with number of digits, so things are so bad. Okay, so now if you ask another problem of factoring, so it is like this number I want to find its factors or prime factors, it appears that this is a difficult task. And, uh, and the best classical algorithm in this case approximately like this. I'm sorry, it's not very rigorous statement, but the point is that it's the scaling is faster than any polynomial scaling. Any Fixed scale you put here, this scaling will surpass this polynomial scale. Okay. And it's also, but it's also slower than exponential. Okay. So super polynomials are exponential things for the best classical algorithm to factor them. So this is this is regarded as a hard task because it's super polynomial scaling. So for example, if you plot it. And the uh, number of digits in a number you want to multiply a factor, and then number of operations you need to perform to do it. Then you see that initially maybe the difference is not so huge, but later on it's tremendous because this is logarithmic scale here. And for example, if you had a supercomputer operating from the beginning of the universe, you would be able to compute this. Um, you, would, you, would, you would be able to, to have this number of operations performed. So. And digits here is in terms of uh, decimals. Um, okay. So probably you know that uh, this is good, that factoring is difficult, because this is the basis of public crypto systems that, that all of us use. And if factoring was easy, we would not feel secure when we see HTTPS symbol. And, uh, okay. So, so formally, and I understand that at this faculty you probably see such things like Turing machines and complexity classes. So we formalize all algorithms, at least all classical algorithms, to formalize. Uh, in a way that you say, that you ask how many operations are required, how, element, how many elementary operations are required to perform on so called Turing machine, okay, which is a paradigmatic computer, classical computer. And, and then you, you, compute, you define different complexity classes for algorithms. So, so in particular, P are algorithms which you can solve in polynomial time. Uh, so, for example, multiplication or addition. And P is uh, the problems that you can check if the solution is correct in polynomial time. Okay, and then there are different classes where it's uh, polynomial space, but time will be not polynomial. And then you need uh, exponential space, exponential time, and we finally have this class of undecidable problems which are known to really the stop problem. And as you can see, there are all question marks here. So, and now it is written on the complexity theory, as far as I understand. But now, if you want to, to see how, uh, how uh, quantum physics are related into this picture, um, we would need to, to define a new complexity class, 
this complexity class that is efficiently can be actually run on quantum computer but on the classical computer. And the question is where this complexity class will be placed here. Because this will determine whether quantum computers are useful for some reason. So, so until physicists came into, into, into computing fields, uh, I mean, computer science and mathematicians were, were doing all the job. But essentially, computing is a physical process. So that's why physicists have something to say. So I will first mention a result which is not really very much related to our talk today. But this is actually the first important example where people realize that you should think about the physics of your computing device because it may be important for, for how well these devices uh, perform. So there is this famous Landauer principle, which was formulated in the 1960s, which tells you that if you perform an irreversible operation, so for example, if you have an end gate like here, okay, which has two bits at the input and one bit at the output, you have this logic table here, and you see that while you have two bits at the input, the output is only single bit, so this operation is irreversible. You cannot, uh, in general, recover the inputs from the output. And uh, this means that, uh, that by lambda law principle, such an operation requires uh, some, it, it, it is intimately related with some heat generation. So, so you can think about it in, in the following way that, that if I have, um, if I have uh, uh, such a system and I want to compute. To compute this, this elementary gate will, will emit kT, where k is the Boltzmann constant and t is the temperature of the impedance uh, heat. So it also means that you need to, uh, to provide power for your computer. So if you know how much elementary operations your, your computer, computer performs, then you can calculate what is the minimal amount of, of power it requires. To be running. Okay. Um, so, uh, in fact, uh, even present day classical computers are not yet limited by this. Because they still have some much more uh, imperfections that, that result in larger heat production. But maybe one day this, this uh, principle will. Will be relevant for, for classical computers. So actually, there's not really much point on here, but it's like phys when physics enters computing, and it's maybe relevant. But now we go one step further, and we realize that the world is quantum. So we would like to think about computing from this quantum perspective. Okay, and this was already envisioned in in a famous uh, lecture by Feynman. Where he said, there is plenty of room at the bottom, nothing that I can see if the physical laws says that computer elements cannot be made enormously smaller than they are now. And indeed, he was right. <coughs> and then he later on envisioned that what we would call a quantum computer. Now we can, in principle, make a computing device in which the numbers are represented by a row of atoms. With each atom in either of the two states, the ones move around, the zeros move around. Finally, around a particular bunch of atoms, one and zeros occur that represent the answer. Nothing could be made smaller, nothing could be more elegant. So, so this is kind of a prediction of what a quantum computer might be, even though it's not really rigorously probably what we would then for a quantum computer. The, the, the essential point is that we want to restore information in elementary quantum systems and manipulate it using lots of time. Okay. So when the quantum computer will, will appear on our desks, so there is this famous Moore law, uh, 
uh, which I'm not sure holds still, but assuming it holds, it tells us that approximately uh, uh, every every two years the density of elementary electronic uh, elements on, on, on the integrated circuits they they reduce their size by uh, 1.5 or something. So this is this is basically like exponential uh, reduction in size um, over time of electronic devices. So you can now ask, okay, if, if this tendency goes on, in, in which year will you derive the situation in, in a single transistor ratio of the size of the line? Okay. So, so that, that's why how you can predict when real quantum computers should appear. And it's, it's, it can be extrapolated, this, this, this dependence, and then you realize that it will be like 20 or 20 years. So if it does not happen, then it means that the world will, will, will not be valid anymore. Or if it, if it, if it is valid, then you will have a computer that operates in serial atoms. So this will be hopefully quantum computer. But still, it's uh, it's not sufficient requirement. It, you might say it's a necessary requirement to be able to control single atoms. Maybe it was not necessary. No. Anyway. It's, pro it's not sufficient. So even if you can manipulate single atoms, it does not mean you have a quantum computer. Because for quantum computer, you need something more. You need to really be able to think about this elementary bit as a qubit, so as a quantum bit. And the quantum bit means that you will not only are able to store zeros and ones in it, but you are able to store arbitrary quantum superpositions. So states in which you have like an atom with a ground and excited states, uh, an atom with a ground and excited states simultaneously. So it's, it's in kind of smeared state, which is a bit in a ground and a bit in excited. Or if you think about photons, you can think about a photon which goes one half and the other at the same time. Or you can say it goes nine. It's in some weird state, which is the superposition. So why why this will be uh, a significant advantage to have such uh, such a superposition? So the main, the main idea behind quantum computing is the so-called quantum parallelism. So you can now think that you have n qubits. So each of these lines it represents a single qubit. And you can perform quantum gates on the qubit. So the quantum gates are generalization of classical logical gates in a way that they able to operate on superposition. But they are very similar to classical gates. If you, if you write how they act on at zeros and ones, they look almost the same, but they additionally need to have this property that they are able to act on superposition. So we have some quantum logical circuits, which you can plot like this. And then what is quantum parallelism? Quantum parallelism is, uh, is the fact that you can prepare your initial state in a superposition of, for example, in, of all n digit numbers. So instead of feeding your device with a single set of zeros and ones, you perform you prefer a full superposition of all to the power n numbers. Okay, and then you send it through these gates. And actually, quantum mechanics is a theory where evolution of quantum systems is linear. And it means that if you define some operation U, in quantum mechanics is always unitary operation, if it's ideal system. Then if it's U acts on some basis state, in summary, then on a superposition, it will just act as a, as a linear operator. So if you fit in superposition of 
all this initial data, at the output you will have the superposition of all the answers, all the arguments of this computation. So this view I call some computation process. And thanks to the fact that you can use superpositions, you can basically compute um, this problem for all initial data, for exponentially many initial uh, data in one step. And this is called quantum parallelism. Okay. So it looks great, but there is a problem. We can write such things on paper or, or, or on the slide, but the question in real life is how to now read out these results okay, of our computers. Because this is the state we would like to, to, to know the answer, so we would like to learn what are these, all of these output states. But in fact, what, what in quantum mechanics you can do, if we are given a single copy of a quantum system, we can only measure it once. And if we measure it, we have to define in what basis we measure it. So formally, these objects, they are vectors in a Hilbert space. And by saying that we perform a measurement, we define some orthonormal basis in this Hilbert space. And what we can do, we can project this state on some orthonormal basis and see on which vector it was projected. And what we can predict is only to say with what probability it will be projected on each of these vectors. And in the end, we read out that the state is this, it was projected on some. So it is far less than just looking at it seeing all these output vectors here. And that's the real problem of quantum computing. That, I mean, essentially you see that it's there. Okay? It's a really powerful thing. But you have now to design algorithms in a way that indeed they require parallel computation, but not in a trivial way. So in the end, they they should not amount just to the statement, okay, I want to read out all these results. They should read out, they should require something which is a much subtle function of these results, some kind of relation between these results. And if you are able to construct such an algorithm, then maybe you can benefit from that. But it's highly material. So, so the first idea was, was given by George, how to do it. And this is the simplest quantum algorithm. And in its, in its standard version, it's, it's the problem like this. But you can have a function, a single bit function. So it's given a bit and outputs a bit. And you ask, hmm, what do you ask? You ask whether there should be inequality. So you ask whether this function is constant, so it gives the same output for each input, or is it, or is it, uh, it has different different outputs for different inputs. Okay. So uh, so now classically, if you wanted to to uh, learn which of these cases take place, what should you do? You should calculate f as a function of 0 and f as a function of 1. Okay? So we need two times, for cubic two times. There is no other way to, to, to learn. Just please remember this is inequality here. <coughs> so now we ask, can we do better with using quantum computing ideas? So first we have to define a quantum gate which will implement this calculating calculation of this function. So we will define gate which produces it's acting on a vector which can be like zero and one vector, so two basis vector, you have two basic vectors, zero and one. And we define a unitary operation that depends on the function in such a way that it produces this vector but maybe it will be multiplied by minus one 
or by plus one, depending on the function is one or more. So this is the way we implement this classical function into a quantum operation of that. It just multiplies the vector by minus one. Okay, and now we prepare our input qubit in a superposition of zero and one. And we act with this with this gate. And then by this uh, linearity of evolution, we see that it acts on zero and gives us minus one to the power f of zero, and then minus one to the power f of one gives us the vector one. Okay? So this is just a single computation here. We just use this gate once. And now we want to see that it's enough. Okay? So contrary, contrary to classical problem, where we need to use it two times. Here we will only use it once. So why? Because now you see that depending on this, whether it's this case or this case, so you see, if, if we have f equals 0, f of, of 0 equals f of 1, it means that this exponents here are the same. So this means that this output state is 0 plus 1 with plus or minus sign in front. Okay. So formally, you could write, you could draw it in, 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 in your vector space as such. So it's, these are the basic vectors 0 and 1, and here is 0 plus 1. Okay. This vector, and minus 0 plus 1 will be the vector coming from the other one. Now, if, if this is the second case, so if functions are different, you will get a, get a relative sign between these two terms. Which means you get zero minus one with plus one. So then this vector is this one or this one. Actually, physically, yes. It, there could be a lot of spellings, yes. Yeah? So, so here, yes. Yeah? yeah. So then I mentioned it for the fifth time. There should be inequality here, yes. Yeah. But good that you are. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. So, uh, so there's inequality here all the time. So now you see that we produce two vectors which are orthogonal to each other. Okay? And now we can perform the quantum measurement exactly in this basis. So we take one basis vector to be 0 plus 1, the other basis vector to be 0 minus 1, and we project our state in this basis. And we, if we measure this state, we know that uh, functions are identical for different input output. If we produce this state, we know that the functions are different, and this is this case. That's to get a single computation. Now, there is some sort of physics, plus minus stuff, which is in front of the vector, which has no physical meaning. Okay, so for physicists, this vector is physically equivalent to this vector. In quantum mechanics, multiplying your quantum state by a complex number of modulus one makes no difference. To the physical context of this case. So that's why the fact that this is plus minus is irrelevant. Okay. So are there any questions? Because I, I think that if you want to understand something from quantum computing, this is something you can easily understand, and everything else is just an organization of it. This is the essence. That you perform parallel computation, and then you do not ask for the result of the function, but some relation between them. So, like here, you only ask whether they're equal or different, and that's why there is no problem with this reading out of the result. You cannot do simultaneously. You can read out only something, and this something must be something you really need. And that's a good quantum algorithm. Yeah. So, so okay. So in I can give different different answers. So in formally the quantum mechanics, it's like this that all you observe, all you can predict are probabilities, and probabilities are computed as a modulus square of scalar product of your vector with some basic vector, and that's why this phase factor we always comes last because there is a modulus square. Um, the other 
Eric is, if you, if you, if you think more physically about it, and, and for example, states of light interference, because like a model for quantum effects could be interference light or photon traveling through two slits on a screen. So you extend your light, it goes through two slits, and then you interfere on the screen. And now, depending on the position of the screen, you get either constructive or destructive interference. Now, in, in quantum language, if you want to describe such an interference effect, you would say that your photon is in superposition of going one hole to the other hole, and it somehow splits, and then interferes on the screen. And then, these two ways are the zero and one. So now, if you say that I multiply states of both of the stuff, it, it physically just means that you uh, increase the length of the path the photon has to travel, but in the same way in both of the poles. And this will not change interference pattern, because interference pattern always seems like relative phases between the two parts in a particular position. But we can also see physically, we can always think about such terms as representing for as representing photon traveling two different paths, and then you perform some experiment where you interfere the path. And multiplying both terms by the same size physically means we got let it evolve for a longer path. So the, the same size is being applied for both of the terms and interference is still does not change. But if you add now relative phase, so you just for example add minus here but no minus here, it changes the relative phase between them and for example in interference picture, you change for a bright uh, post to dark. What do you have to say about the zero and the zero zero b about plus and zero one? Yeah. And zero plus one is a superposition of those. Two, it's right? a superposition. superposition of those two. Then how do we interpret this zero minus one? Because it's probably a superposition, but it's a different relative phase. So logically, you would still say that this is like an equal probability of measuring zero and equal probability of measuring one. In one of this things. In this, in this, in this point of view, there is no difference. So if you just ask whether my cubic is a zero or one, there's no difference between these two. But you can now switch to different level and values. So that's that's what quantum theory gives you, that it gives you the whole set of all superpositions, and you may equally well say that I'm not measuring in zero and one value, I'm measuring in zero plus one, zero minus one value. So the size of the space is two times the space of the field, right? Always? Yes, so it's okay. The, the size of the whole space. Yes. Yes, yes. because each cubic is a two-dimensional system. Okay. It's called the yeah, okay. So the amplitudes are very complex numbers. So you always define feedback, you can define feedback by providing a basis. A basis for a single qubit is zero or one. If I have n qubits, then all combinations of zeros and ones, just all n digits numbers. And I can write that these are our orthogonal vectors. Because I can measure in this basis, and I can explicitly say whether my set is this, this, or this. But in quantum language, I can also take arbitrary superpositions of it. Which means that I will create a vector space of dimension 2 to the power n. And I can have such space with arbitrary complex numbers in front. Okay, for my you always normalize that. So numbers are normalized to 1. The model is square of these numbers is up to 1. And additionally, I can always say that the phase that multiplies every phase is irrelevant. And this additional. Uh, number and then I have a full description of the next two bits. So when you one point, yes. Yes. So 
you ask how to do it in these different lenses. Yeah? You measure it in zero plus one. Yes. Okay, but, but your question is about how to measure single qubits in this big basis or how to measure this n qubit in this big space? Both questions, okay. Okay, so this is very interesting. So, of course, it depends on physical condition. So, for example, if you, if you think, I don't know what, what's more appealing to you, whether it's the levels of atoms. Or photons traveling different paths. What do you prefer? What? Which one is better? Levels of atoms? Okay. So if you have zero atomic levels, then measuring in zero and one could be like taking to which energy I will carry the zero on it, but we measure energy of the atom. The power is the order of the object. Okay, let's assume this is zero. So now if you want to Measure in this basis, a physicist would usually be what is a physicist in general do, he will or she will let the system evolve for some time with a Hamiltonian that changes this basis to this basis. So you, you apply some additional unitary operation which you can control, you know how it acts, which will change this basis to this basis, and then you measure it in simple manner. This is how this thing will be done. So you are right that this is not intuitive how to measure the reality. You usually measure it in effect by a sort of additional operation that transfers you to the basis which is simple to measure in physical. For example, with, with, with photons, it's easy to measure zero and one because if you have these two paths, it just means to check whether the photon is here or here. Here or here. Now, if I want to check whether it's zero plus one or zero minus one, I have to interfere these two paths first. And this will cause, for example, on a beam splitter, so on a bus which has like 50% transmission, 50% reflection, I interfere it and then I measure where photon went in the end. And this is actually exactly, this corresponds exactly to this. So this additional operation on after. So here my additional operation would be this beam splitter, which would transfer these two positions to zero or one at the output, so it will send my photon to either one arm or the other. Okay. It's okay. So any any more questions? Any no more questions? Good. Um, so this is this is the summary of the door calculus. So the door calculus is not very impressive because it just gives you a factor of two improvement, and for a problem which is not so interesting, probably. But still, it was the first example of an algorithm, and it's very simple to understand. And now there comes a much more interesting algorithm, the so-called short algorithm. Which I will not describe in detail, maybe because it will require a full lecture. But Chow algorithm is an algorithm that allows you to factor numbers. So I mentioned in the beginning that factoring is a difficult problem, and if we could factor, we could, we could steal a lot of money. And the Chow algorithm actually does it. So if you remember, classical computer complexity was super polynomial. Okay, so the, it, the complexity grew faster than any polynomial, n to the power of 100 or anything you want. Sure, I want complexity is only n to the power of L. So it's only a bit larger than multiplication. Okay? So it's extremely fast. So if we only had a quantum computer on which we could run the short algorithm, the world will be changed forever. So you see, if, if I add a plot here, it's like not far from this multiplication. So, uh, so then everything will not be secure. So I just I just mentioned 
as I, as I said, I could not explain it in, the, in, the, in detail, but I will just mention that the essential element in Shor algorithm is the so called quantum Fourier transform. So if you know, uh, Fourier transform is also a quite computationally consuming task in classical computers. And uh, if you have, uh, like, if you have, uh, uh, if you have your data, you have a data which consists of two to the n. So, like, it's something very easy, okay? Because what's what's for your transforming future? If you're something in music and you want to see the frequency profile of your music, okay, where is the more bass or something. So, so if you sample your music and you have two to the n samples and you want to perform for a four year transform, then you will need two to the two n elementary operations to do it. There is something called fast Fourier transform. It's a classical algorithm that reduces this two to the two n to n to two n. So it gives you one two to the n and to n. So it's like exponentially fast, but still exponentially complex. Uh, while there is a quantum Fourier transform, so this unitary operation that you can implement using n squared states. So it's exponentially faster and fast Fourier transform. Of course, it has this drawback that you cannot read out the, the result. Okay, as in the classical algorithm, you could. But actually, the problem can be in an intelligent way translated to the problem of, of performing Fourier transform without really the need to read out all the answer, but just try to read out some periods of certain functions. Because you can imagine that Fourier transform sometimes detects how to detect frequencies very well. So indeed in this case, this, this is the whole scheme of, of, of our algorithm. But but the, the essential feature, and this is what gives you the speed up, is this this block here, which is this counter to the and because of this, you get the increased exponential reduction in complexity. Yeah, yeah okay, it's this way. Inverse means it's, it's inverse operation. Yeah. Like unitary, you have a unitary matrix, you have inverse and unitary matrix. Can you invert what? Yes. Ah, can you invert it? Yes. Okay, so maybe I should, I should mention it in the beginning. Classical computation is usually done using reversible gates. This is what I mentioned with this lambda principle and all this stuff. And you have this end gate that takes this to this one, and it's irreversible. Quantum computing is almost always done using reversible schemes. So you always, in this plot like I put here, you always have the same number of qubits at the input, the same number of qubits at the output, typically. Sometimes you throw away some of them in the end. But when you compute things, you always keep all the qubits on the run. And as I mentioned, quantum mechanics operations are unitary. Unitary operations mathematically are, are always inversible. Okay? Because the inverse of a unitary matrix is just as complicated. It's always inversible. It does not lose any information. So for quantum computing, it's always done using reversible computation. You can always reverse it and go back. And here you measure. When you measure, you, you no longer think. You no longer reverse it. And measurement is the point where you break this. So, I just, I just said it. so thank you. Of course, you can also do chemical computation using reversible statements. But I think Lubar does it, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, because, because it, it grows really complex in terms of you know, the metrics and gates and so on. Of course, it has its advantages in principle, you do not have this number of 
limited. Right? If you perform a very simple computation, you are not limited by this characteristic uh, emission. But, but still, as I, as I mentioned, at the moment, it's not really a problem for certain day computers. But on the other hand, the complexity of the perversion is far larger than this irreversible. But in quantum mechanics, we have to be reversible because usually, if you do something irreversible, you destroy the super projection. So we really don't want the availability in quantum mechanics until we have it. Ah, yes. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you lose it for Macy in the end, yes. You can, you can also apply normal analytics to that. So typically, if, if, if you remove it for Macy, you, you always miss it and it so, yes, one of the principles is uh, very universal, basically. Okay, so let's come back to this X. So, where is this quantum algorithm in this picture? So, complexity class related with quantum computing is usually the, the most popular name. Task is BQP, which, is, which means bounded error quantum polynomial class. Which basically means that you can run quantum algorithm in polynomial time, and, uh, and the error is bounded. So, so it's not like that, you know the error grows, and the probability of error grows to one okay, when you run it. Because then it would be like probabilistic machine, which very rarely gives you the correct answer. It will give you like a high probability of good answer, even if you go to the limit of like other digits. So, so from this, you see that there is some hope that some of empty problems could be within this BQP class. And uh, so, for example, factoring. Of course, nobody proved anything because no proof available, I think, in complexity theory. But this is what is expected that this factoring is somewhere here. So, uh, now, what are, what are other quantum algorithms? So this is this Deutsch algorithm I mentioned before. We have the Schroer algorithm, which indeed gives you exponential speed up, unless there is some unknown classical algorithm for factoring, which also gives you the same, which we are not using. But we really cannot prove that quantum algorithm is possible because we don't know the bounds for the very possible classical algorithm. Then there is Grover algorithm, which I put in gray because it gives you only quadratic data. The Grover algorithm allows you to search through unstructured database. So if you have um, the, the, the typical you, you, you presented in a way that you want to you have a telephone book, yes, and you want to find uh, what you want to find whose uh, who's name. It's related to telephone number six five four three two one zero. So you have to go to your telephone book to check where is this phone number. Okay, and it's unstructured because the telephone has this is ordered by name and not by phone number. Okay, so that's why you need linearly the time to to find the message you are interested in draw linearly with the number of elements in the database. And classically, you cannot uh, overcome it. While the Grover algorithm is a way that allows you to find this empty square root. In time, it draws a square root of number of elements. So it's interesting, but it's only quadratic improvement. And taking into account complexity of everything that's quantum, quadratic improvements are not so clearly adaptable over classical. And so that's why I put it in gray. Unlike Shore, where you have to explain that, even if you have to play more, then the gains are also high. So then there are some other algorithms that people try to invent, because as you can imagine, I hope from what I said, it should be clear for you that it's very difficult to find a new quantum algorithm. Because you have to find this clever way to combine all the results to give you the answer for what you need, but you, you cannot just read that. You have to just play with them in a clever way. 
So there is, there is, a, there are also some uh, algorithms related to, to deciding whether the graph is connected or not. But this also is only like quadratic gain in, in similar to growth. And recently there was a big, uh, big news. Again, recent. It was three years ago. Because because it was found out that you could have an exponential figure, maybe you could have an exponential figure in something which a lot of people would find extremely useful. So so-called customer recommendation system. So if you if you have this uh, Amazon or Netflix uh, companies, they store a lot of data comparing to your choices, for the movies that you like and what books you read. And then they store it for you and all other people. So usually it's stored in a very huge matrix. So like there are people and there are these movies. Okay. And each person has only very few entries because nobody can watch all the movies. Okay? So so this is sparse matrix. A very special But understanding the structure of this matrix can help you to advise a user what movie he should watch next to be the most happy possible. Yeah? So to enjoy it most. And uh, this is the recommendation system. That they give you a next book or next movie that you should watch because they see how well your choices are correlated with of other people, and because there is a partial algorithm that was complete, it allows them to guess what will be your next in that shot. In mathematics, this problem is often uh, often uh, translated to the problem of inverting this matrix, solving a linear equation. And of course, this matrix is huge, and inverting it takes a lot of time. So people were thinking how, how, how we can improve it to the quantum algorithm. And actually there was a quantum algorithm that was shown that it cannot invent this matrix, but it can, it can produce you this sample that you really will like. Without really inverting it completely, it gives you the samples that you really want. So I'm solving this problem. Just walking a bit around it, but solving it. And indeed it, it, it was uh, in, this, in, this, in this problem, it, it seemed that there is exponential speed up, but actually in 2018, this panel was shown that it's a classical algorithm. But, but interestingly, this classical algorithm was really based on the quantum algorithm. Because it used very similar ideas, but they realized that you can translate it in a way that you really do not need this quantum stuff anymore. Because you don't, because you don't have to invert, yeah. and the is logarithmic. It's logarithmic in this side. So in this side, it's an answer, because producing the samples is only logarithmic in the size of the matrix. Of course, you cannot invert the logarithmic size. Because there are more entries, yes, but this side is algorithm it has a different sample. Okay? Of course, this matrix has to be stored somewhere. But provided it's stored in something where you can access it in a quantum way, it only requires the limited number of operations to produce the next sample for the user at that time. But as I said, unfortunately, it's not an example that you can show. And, and I understand that people here at the Faculty of Mathematics are excited about this realization of machine learning algorithms. So quantum machine learning algorithms. And, and so in some sense, this, this problem is, a, is an example of this kind of And a lot of people work on this, but I'm afraid I'm not able to give you like a concrete example where I could say that, yes, this is like quantum speed. But uh, we have some experts here. <laughs> Maybe they tell you something more. OK, uh, I think I'm running short of time. Oh, okay, good. Two minutes. Now, when you talk about quantum computing uh, and you, you have some clever people in the audience, then sometimes such a, such a question appears. Uh, 
So you are talking about the superpositions and all this stuff, but basically we know that you have also superpositions in classical physics, like waves. You can consider superposition of classical waves, like waves on the water. And formally, it looks very similar to what I'm talking about. So like the superposition of zero plus one, okay, I can say that this wave is zero, this wave with different frequencies one, I take a, this wave and this wave simultaneously, okay? And I have this double wave here, okay? And this is my two weeks. And it's formally okay to say something like this. But, uh, but then you could ask, okay, so where is this quantum advantage come from? And this is actually the question about what's the difference between, difference between quantum computing and analog computing. Because that's a way thing that you use to compute could be a version of analog computer. So there's nothing discrete there, nothing to discretize, everything is continuous. And actually, this is the, the reason that we have, of course, superpositions, but in quantum theory, we have more. Uh, we have discrete results, and thanks to this, we have also we can also think about errors in our system as being discretized. So actually, if you thought about waves and water and want to perform uh, much more demanding computation, so it encodes more digits in your waves, okay? You would need to use more frequencies and more frequencies, okay, more of the See, the number of frequencies would grow exponentially with the number of digits. And you may imagine that if everything is continuous and analog, there is no computation, the, the noise will kill you. Okay, at some point, everything will be cleared out and you could not read out anything. But in quantum theory, it's different because everything is in some sense continuous in the sense of this wave and superposition, but still measurements are discrete and you project on the basis. And also, you can discretize errors. And this is the key point I want to mention, which is the reason why quantum computing makes sense at all from a physical perspective. Because you could invent quantum algorithms for all this stuff. But if you did not know how to do quantum error correctly, nothing would work in practice. Because even if you build a very good gate in a physical system, there always will be errors. Okay? Like in classical systems. In this computer, you also have classical error correcting code to keep your memory, to store your information, to keep your storage device, to, to protect information. And so on. Because, for example, let's say I have a gate which acts well 99% of the time, but 1% of the time it fails. Okay? And now let's say I run store algorithms with I don't know, thousands of gates, thousands of gates, and so on. If each gate fails 1%, it's 1% probability, and I have like 100,000 gates, then the probability that all, all of them succeed. Okay, it's like, it's like 99 percent to the power of 100,000 or something from the year. Okay? So there's no chance I will succeed to calculate anything. So I need to have a theory and a method to do quantum error correction to really be able to make these errors as low as possible, even if my elements are faulty. Okay, okay so this is the idea. And, uh, okay. So the idea is that we need to have a method to protect this superposition. So imagine the simplest situation. Okay, I'm not sure how how much you will allow me to speak here, but in, in just in case of stop. So imagine you have this superposition. And let's assume we have a very simple error. For the moment, assume the only error that can happen is a bit flip, which means that zero goes, goes to one and one goes to zero. This means that with probability P, this state psi goes to alpha one plus beta zero. Okay. If we did nothing, in quantum language, it would mean that instead of pure state we had before, we have something called mixed state, a noisy representation of a quantum state, 
where with probability t we have this space and with probability one minus t we have this space. Okay. But now you can you can use an error correcting code. Error correcting code in this case will be something like this: that you have this logical qubit here, and you encode it into three physical qubits. This is like the simplest error correcting code that you would know from classical error correcting code, if you know that. So you simply encode it like this. Now, if you assume that uh, level of errors is low enough that only that at most one bit flip, it means that either no error happens and you are still left with this state, or error happens on qubit one. Then you have this state, or error happens on qubit two, you have this state, or error happens on qubit three, you have this state. Okay. Now, what's, what's, what's nice about it? Even though you don't know alpha and beta, so you don't actually know this proposition, you should now see that this state lives in orthogonal subspace to this state, and this, and to orthogonal subspace to this state, and to this state. So all of these cases. They live in orthogonal subspaces because they have different uh, basic vectors in this proposition. Which means that in principle you can perform a measurement which just tells you in which subspace you are. It's like projection measurement, but not projecting you on a given vector, but on subspaces. Like it's, you could say that it's kind of weaker measurement than PKE. Okay? We would call it like whole grain measurement, so a measurement with just projection of subspaces, and, and gives you an information which subspace you are in. And then, if you know you are in this subspace, you do nothing. If you know you are in this subspace, you additionally perform again another bit flip on the first bit to go from this state back to the original state okay? without actually measuring which of these two states you are in. Because this would destroy the position. So you don't measure which state of this two you are in, you just measure which subspace, either this subspace or this subspace. And thanks to this, you measure, you detect error, and you correct it, preserving superposition. Okay? And that's a great idea, but now you have to believe me that what I described here with just a simple error with the bit actually works for arbitrary error. And the reason for this is that you can discretize them. And this code would not work for actual errors, but a code involving nine qubits or seven or maybe five would work. So you have to make a more sophisticated code to be able to correct for other errors that can happen to a qubit, but you can do it. And you can again have a protocol where you protect your subspaces and correct errors and keep your superposition alive. We do not collapse if we uh, if we in which subspace we yes. but we would collapse if we much more and ten right? Yes. So you would collapse if you measure if you measure in this this is this state lives in eight dimensional space. Because if you have three qubits put to the NS And if you perform a measurement which will tell you which of these eight states you are in, you would have a problem. So instead you have to be clever and perform a measurement that gives you less information. It just tells you whether this is it, this space, two dimensional space, whether well, this is it, two dimensional space. Of course, you have to know how to do it, but that's not that complicated. You have to again perform some operations that, for example, only feel some kind of quality of the interface. Okay. So I so, so what I described here is the standard approach to quantum computing. You have games like in classical computing, so the quantum games and quantum computing. And and there is a nice theorem that actually you don't need so many different games to build a universal quantum circuit. Like in classical log classical circuit, you can make one well, logical game to build arbitrary logical circuit. In quantum computing, what you need is one gate which is actually two qubits, for example, so called C not gate, which is like a generalization of the store, which is called not gate. And then 
two loop cubic operations. So operations that would operate on a single cubic without interacting with others. So single qubit games are usually very easy to implement in the package. You just, for example, for photon, you just use the beam splitters, delay light. For atom, you just send some light paths on your atom to prepare superposition of two, of two levels of this atom. The difficult thing is to perform this controlled node gate, which is kind of gate, it involves two qubits, so two atoms or two photons, and they have to interact with each other. Okay, to, to perform this gate. This, is like, this gate requires interaction between two people. And if one had this gate and could combine them with others, then quantum computer would be big because we know how to do quantum error corrective code. So we would build this quantum error corrective code for this gate. This is the perfect. And then we know how to run solar environment. So if we had like you know, 100,000 know, gates with 99%. Fidelity probably showed that it could be run and break the present day crypto. Okay, so this is just the scene of gate, this logic of table. So so indeed, so so we would have quantum computer provided we can we can satisfy these constraints. So we have to be able to prepare to the position to have high fidelity gate, so gate with low noise, but not perfect noise, because this quantum correction will help us. And we need to combine them in bigger things. Yes. 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 Yeah, you can you can connect them in different ways. And you can prove that arbitrary unitary operation on n qubit can be decomposed into single qubit unitary gates and two qubit in gates. And in this way, and this is essential to count complexity of quantum algorithms. Because to say something about complexity, you need to define what is your elementary operation. Okay? So, for example, in the quantum computing community, you define okay, the number of single qubit gates and uh, peanut gates tells you what is the complexity or how it grows the size of the problem. Okay? So, so, this is like standard approach of quantum computing. With and develop still. But there are some alternative approaches to quantum computing which formally are equivalent, but maybe they have some advantages. So, this is a very physical way to approach a computing problem. It's called adiabatic quantum computing. So, the basic idea is such that you have a, you have a quantum system with a lot of particles which uh, which interact in some way, and and uh, you can prepare them in some initial step, okay? and that's easy to prepare. So you can you can prepare them in some state, which is a ground state of some simple Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian describes the physics of your system, right? how, how elements interact, what are the elements. So so this is your starting point. And then you are you you cleverly think of another Hamiltonian for which the ground state of this qubit is a solution to your problem. Okay. So of course it requires a lot of thinking. Okay. So which Hamiltonian will have a ground state which is a solution to some problem I want to solve. Okay. But once you have it, then you can run total adiabatic. Uh, evolution, which means you tune your knob in your laboratory in a way that your initial Hamiltonian is gradually changed to this final Hamiltonian. So this F parameter here goes from 0 to 1, okay, but slowly. And there is something called adiabatic theorem in quantum physics, which tells you that if you run this transition slowly enough, your ground state will remain the ground state of the final Hamiltonian. If you change this S slowly enough, you start with ground state of Hi, and you will end up in a ground state of the Hf. And then you read out your result. In the and this is actually you know, how the duet operates. Okay, if you heard about this company in Canada, which 
apparently they deal with quantum computers, which they do not, but what, what they do is they, they, they give quantum adiabatic machines. So the machines that, that do these things. And the problem is this statement slow enough. Because if you now want to prove some quantum advantage, you have to prove that you are faster than any classical algorithm. And unfortunately, what they do is that they give this device and say, okay, let's do this. Let's see what happens. Okay? And they compute something and they show, okay, that's nice. But then a few months later, some, some people say, okay, we did it on a classical computer. We have implemented this algorithm in a different way and we, we obtained the same speed up. So it's no quantum advantage. And actually, you should not expect a big quantum advantage from the machine learning system because it's very noisy. So even though, in principle, this idea is good, you can prove that it's equivalent to the circuit-based quantum computing. The essential thing is here is how the noise affects the speed with which you can go through this idea about algorithm. And this is what physicists say that if you analyze this new way, you will see that this speed is slow and you cannot get this, this uh, computation now. Uh, yes. Uh, I think I wanted to say something. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so now just to just to give you other ideas. So, more conventional way to approach quantum computing is using so called ion traps, where you really have single ions and you perform quantum gains on them and you address each individual ion and you allow them to interact by, by pairs, performing spin up gates, and so on, by making use of the fact that they oscillate together in a common trap. You have also an idea when you try to perform quantum computing just using photons, which at first sight seems to be impossible because photons do not interact. And I said that spin of gains requires interaction. Photons just do not interact with the classical, right? so we don't see each other. But if you are clever, you can combine this interference of photons with some single photon detection scheme, which can conditionally produce. Uh, transformations that you need for quantum computing. So, again, I cannot explain it in details, but there is a way to build a fully optical quantum computer. And there are these ideas based on superconducting devices where you make use of the fact that superconductivity is one of very few phenomena which is quantum but still macroscopic. So, so you really can have this current in a superconducting system, but the basis of superconductivity is still very quantum phenomenal. And in, in this way, you can make qubits which are not extremely small. So you can make qubits where you have electronic circuits of the size of the super electronic circuit, and you can play with them and prepare a superposition of current flowing one way or the other, or Electric charge being here and there, okay, and it's very really a And this is actually the, the way that most of the companies like IBM, Google, Microsoft are, are pursuing, and what they build, like this 50 or something quantum computing device. And actually, Dewey also uses this type of superconducting qubits. But as I mentioned, Dewey uses it in a completely different architecture, so in this adiabatic approach. While these uh, companies are really building like more typical quantum computer where you perform games and so on. Okay, this is good. Okay, so uh, okay, I'll skip. So I just finish with the last slide. So I just give this last slide saying that apart from quantum computing, which we may expect to make some progress in the near future. So in principle, we can expect like 100 qubit quantum devices. These are like noisy quantum computers here. So they, they, they will 
graph, they, they will not have implemented this quantum error correction idea. Because this quantum error correction idea requires a significant overhead in the number of qubits. So maybe in the next year or two, we will have like a noisy 100 qubit quantum computer, or maybe within this framework, the two qubit quantum error correction device. So like this really, we perform two quantum error correction and can preserve two logical qubits for a very long time. Okay. So, but I just want to mention something which is a bit closer to my heart, that apart from quantum computing, you have other ideas in quantum technology. Like quantum metrology, which is a way to, again, explore quantum superposition in a way, but never something better than just using photons or atoms in a typical way. And, and, and there is a spectacular experiment, as you know, gravitational wave detection in LIGO. And actually, this year, they are implementing so called cube light in this language device, which means that instead of standard laser light, they send in something which can be viewed as light where they are encountered photons. The photons with some non trivial correlations between them. So, this is actually what, what, what I usually think about quantum metrology. So, this is the protocols where you benefit from. And this is actually happening, so it's not like fiction, it's, it's being done, and this will give you a reaction in noise which you can observe. So, this is like real quantum technology in real life, it's being implemented now. The other thing that is really being implemented now is quantum communication idea, so quantum cryptography. So, how to distribute key security. Knowing that nobody is working on okay, so how to do it? And probably most of you heard about Chinese satellite that beats the record of the big time to like a few thousand kilometers. Distributed and hundreds of cars, photons, and in this case, distributed secret key. Okay, sorry for making it longer, but I hope it's good. Yeah, so so if you have noiseless noiseless protocols, then you can show that it will be the same complexity. But the problem is what happens if you have noise? So in standard computing, it's very, you know, okay, it's very easy. I mean, it's known how to quantify, how to deal with noise because we have this quantum error correction ideas and we know how much more gates we need to sacrifice to reduce errors and still have this complexity gain. While in this adiabatic approach, you just, you know, play some heuristic arguments and you really cannot predict well how fast you can go in such and such noise levels. So that's the problem, you just guess. Yes. Okay. Yes. Even you. So, of course, you know, you think of non linear algorithms that it will change a lot. But and they are not there. Yeah, so, so as I said, I mean, how many if you want to have any, so you need like what is SA uses 4,000 bits, I think. So in Turan, you need roughly twice as many logical 
two bits and the number you want to factor. Well, let's say you need 10,000 logical qubits. Now, if you want to have a logical qubit, you need to have like maybe uh, 100 physical qubits to encode the zero correction, fundamental correction. And so 100,000 like that. Physical qubits. With like fidelity, with high fidelity. Is there anything so the law that prevents us from being so some people claim there is but we don't know so some, some people try to argue that okay quantum computing is nice but there is some law like the you know, fourth or fifth law of dynamics that forbids it because on one hand you have to isolate your system on the other hand, you need to let them interact with each other to, to perform this game. So, so maybe there is this compromise that you cannot beat, but this is just a place. Most people will believe that it's only an engineering problem. So you said that there is but the errors that appear in this huge sequence of gains may grow with the number of gains. Yes. And still, this error correction was yes. not very like Yes. Yes, that's true. Because wait, maybe you, you this is what this was a question. Yeah. But okay. So for example, I, I, I can factor a number with hundred digits, okay, and I do it with some small. Now I want to factor. Another recovery digits, okay? Which means the number of my logical qubits increases at the power of three. And of course, I need more, more, more data. And before, I had some parameter of error. Okay? So now, if I increase this protocol longer and longer, these errors may grow not nicely. So now, I need to enlarge my error correcting column to reduce error of a single logical gate. Significantly enough. So now you have to ask the question Does the growth in the quantum error correction size does not destroy the advantage from, from the other? And the good thing is that it's not, because the growth in the complexity of the error correction code is logarithmic. Okay, so it only gives like a logarithmic overhead on this over the polynomial complexity of the other. So the short answer is that. Of course, if you want to go to larger numbers, you have to make better logical gates, which means you have to use bigger quantum error correcting codes. If you use the same physical elements, yes? you have some elementary physical gates, and you build from them logical gates with some reduced error, and you need to reduce this error more and more if you want to factor bigger and bigger numbers. But this quantum error correcting codes, they only grow like logarithmically with the size of the problem. So it does not kill you. But this is very relevant here yes, to know how they grow, to really show that you can reduce errors but still gain this advantage. Okay, so as I mentioned, people try a lot of things, but this factoring is the most like useful one. The others are a bit artificial. So, but of course, this is when I say short algorithm, it's not only short algorithm, it's a whole class of problems. Okay. The short algorithm also, apart from factoring, it has discrete logarithm problem in it because it's very similar. So actually, there is a whole class of problems which are similar to short algorithm, which can be translated to. But but uh, if you ask for a like qualitatively different algorithm with exponential speed up, which would be useful, then I don't know. But this is what people at this faculty should invent. Okay, could you speak it once again? Okay. Okay. 
Yes. So okay. Yeah. No, of course, of course, yes. And and but but this is just because we are in this you know infancy stage of quantum computing. So we just build the dedicated devices, but in principle. You can think of all the schemes that I presented to you in a way that there are some qubits which encode data and some qubits that encode program. Okay? And these qubits that encode program, they determine what kind of gates will be acting on the other qubits. Okay? So, in principle, you can construct such a universal scheme where you do not say that this is quantum computer for factoring and this is quantum computer for something different. So, so in principle, of course, yes, but this requires again some overhead in qubits and so on. So nobody does it at the moment because people fight just to, to build something. Okay? But in principle, it will be very similar to classical. You could have like the universal quantum computing. Maybe I don't know if that experts from from more. I mean, computing. <laughs> Okay, so I just mentioned this recommendation system. Yes, this was a very business example. So unfortunately, it failed in, in the sense that it does not give exponential speed up. But I'm not sure if it failed completely, because in some sense it still gives a speed up which might be significant, even if it's not exponentially faster. So, so maybe this is not completely ruled out, this kind of application. But okay, I'm very bad in business applications. So maybe okay, this is again. Okay, Oh. Yeah, this is this is this slide I skipped. But I understand this was the question for business applications. <laughs> okay, business applications to sell something to scientists. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, oh, okay. Hello, I agree. I joke. I joke. It is, but as I mentioned, it's not that you get this result of this Fourier transform on your table. Yes, that's the problem. If you had this. 
example, that even if you just the I know the results of the Fourier transform, of course, I mean you can apply it everywhere. But the problem is you just get some computation which you have to play with, and you don't have these results on your table. That's the problem. So you have to just use it inside some other problem which only requires some relations that are captured by a Fourier transform, but not the result of your Fourier transform all the results. But isn't that even for design? Yes. Mm. But but it's just you know like to show off, to show off that you are doing something with D-Wave and you, you sound nice, but uh, it's not, it has not proved anything, as far as I know, that would really not be possible to, to do on classical computers. Yes. So, so I, yes. So it's kind of, I would say, it's kind of quantum-inspired computing device that solves in a non-standard way problems, which might be difficult to come up with using standard classical approaches, but still they have not proved they go beyond capability of classical uh, devices. Yes, but, but indeed. Their formulation may sometimes give you a way to avoid, I don't know, local minima trapping in optimization in different way than you usually do in, in, in optimization algorithms you, you would use in classical. So in this sense, they might be useful, valuable. I don't know. You know more about I mean, it. It's not but yeah, the noise. Testing for this available technology, feedback, etc. Et uh, this is necessary really for development of the final product. So maybe we are just in the place. So we, sh we should not lose enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, this one more immediate the optimization uh, results, so to speak, have been. I mean, it's both uh, having a, a real progress, not necessarily using two ways, I should believe that. Yes. Yeah, 
But it's also super conducting. It's a different way of implementing quantum error correction, but in a very expensive way. And I would like to thank you for your Thank you.